What's up? Buenos dias. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you guys coming here to support uh, Why Not Me in, in this conversation. Um, again, Melvin Gregg, Deborah Martin Chase, Yvonne Orji, and Anthony Mackey. Uh, really quickly, the reason we started um, this conversation was I, I moved to Austin and I just realized there was a lot of people of color that lived here that didn't get to meet successful people of color in the entertainment business. So we thought we would start this conversation series to have these conversations with people that are successful, that can give you insight and guidance and, and perspective. So thanks for coming. Um, really quickly, I wanted to see why you guys are here in Austin right now for the festival, what you guys are here to promote. Let's start with Melvin. So I'm here to promote a film called Story Yav directed by Aristotle Torres, and um, yeah. Uh, I have a documentary on Mary Tyler Moore for HBO uh, that I'm producing and be out in May. I, I'm here because Mike Jackson called me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, for you, Mike, anything. <laughs> on Oscar weekend. <laughs> on not, yeah, and, mm, he's so great. Um, but I'm also promoting my book, Bamboozled by Jesus, How God Tricked Me into the Life of My Dreams. So I'll be doing a book signing immediately after this. And are you in the witness protection services? What's happening? I just found some glasses and put them on. Now, I have a movie called uh, If You Were the Last that premiered last night. So it went pretty well. Congratulations, y'all. So we always start these conversations with these folks' origin stories. You know, I, I feel like it's really important to see where people come from, how their journey began, their family, and all these things that kind of inform someone long before they're thinking about a career in entertainment or maybe soon before they're thinking about that career, but what was their journey like? So, Deb, how, tell me a little bit about your, your upbringing. Where are you from, parents, the whole, the whole deal? I call myself a gypsy, family home Chicago, uh, 6 through 15, Southern California, school in Massachusetts, was lived in Houston for four years, right out of law school. Um, in fact, I tell people my, my father-in-law was the first black graduate of the University of Texas, so I have Austin connection. Um, and I was a lawyer. I went to law, I went to Harvard Law School. I practiced law, big firms, big corporations, hated it. Um, I always loved film and television. My dad was the biggest film and television buff that I ever knew, so I grew up in a household where we watched TV and we saw movies on the weekends. But I didn't know anybody in the business and it was so far away from me, so went to law school. And then I just got to a point in my life where I was just like, I can't, this is not my destiny. I was a really good lawyer, but I hated it. And I said, I, this is not my mark. This is not going to be my mark in the world. So for two years, Columbia Pictures had an executive development program designed to bring people in from different disciplines. I made no money. I mean, it was like I just was living on savings, but it put me in the business. And a um, couple of you know fortuitous things along the way, but the first one was I sat at a luncheon next to the new chairman of Columbia, a man named Frank Price who in retrospect was one of the last of the old fashioned studio bosses. We hit it off, I stayed in touch. A couple months later, he brought me on as his executive assistant and that was my big break. And I went with him to all of his meetings. I read scripts for him. At the evening we would sit and I could ask any question that I wanted to, he wanted me to learn. Um, and it was honestly kind of the, the fair haired white guy job. I mean, it was a big deal that you know he had taken me under his wing. And when he was ousted, uh, he gave me a contract and put me on the creative team for Columbia Pictures, and that was my official transition. Wow. Okay. In New Orleans, born and raised in New Orleans? Oh, yeah, 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 504, baby. Yeah, yeah, slow your roll, represent the real, yeah. yeah. You know what it is, babe, come on now. So tell me, tell me about New Orleans growing up as a kid, just like, you know, did you know you wanted to act as a youngster? Was, what was your family life like there? Was there like the support system? Uh, it was harsh. I mean, you have to understand growing up in New Orleans was the murder capital in the world. You know, when I went to school, there were literally shootings at my school. So it was, uh, everybody was looking for an outlet. And in New Orleans, everybody growing up wanting to be a trumpet player. Like I wanted to be Wynton Marcellus growing up. You know, I was in a jazz band, you know? So, um, 
I, I got lucky. My mom, I had great parents, great siblings, uh, fought my sisters every day. And one night, my mom and I were watching the Arsenio Hall show, and I saw leaders of the new school perform Scenario, and Busta Rhyme did his verse. And I turned to my mom and I said, I want to be that guy when I grow up. And all of my dreams of being a police officer and a fireman went out the window. And uh, <laughs> I grew up wanting to be Busta Rhymes. Flip mode is the squizzle. Exactly. That's what it was. <laughs> See, I told you. You weren't old enough to notice. So it was, uh, <laughs> so it, um, yeah, it was just a dream and a wish. And uh, after that, I started taking classes. And, you know, I feel like everything our parents told us, that's what I did. You know, so my dad wasn't allowed to go to school because he grew up in the U.S. track system. So in eighth grade, he was kicked out of school and he went with my grandfather to pick cotton. Wow. So for him, education was very important. So, you know, I went to school and studied acting. There you go. In Virginia? Yeah, yeah. Born and raised, uh, this is loud. <laughs> Born and raised in Portsmouth, Virginia. Um, Grew up single parent home. Uh, I lived in the projects my entire life until I moved to LA. So up until like 22. Um, growing up, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I always had a knack for hustling, um, the legal way. <laughs> you know, buying shoes on eBay, selling them, selling candy, uh, toys, clothes, whatever I could find. Buy for low, sell high. Um, so I felt like that's what I would do, something entrepreneurial. So when I graduated high school, I went to college, Old Dominion University, right across the water in Norfolk, and I majored in business. And while I was there, um, I was kind of just running a, a refund check hustle. <laughs> I wasn't really, you know what I mean, interested in anything Definitely I was studying. Definitely not legal. Hey, man, you know, that, that's my way of getting reparations. You ain't caught him yet. You ain't caught him yet. You still walking that, that's, free. That's my Definitely. reparations, you know. self -snitching. To come from the government, it ain't still. I hope this is not being live streamed. Self-snitching yeah. matters. Hey, the statute of limits You just is over. yourselves. <laughs> right. Put it in my rack. Jesus. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I, I needed to fill my curriculum in order to get that refund check. <laughs> so I took an acting class, and it was the first thing I was ever drawn to that I felt like I could actually do. You know what I mean? Like, not to say I couldn't do anything else, but I didn't have an interest or a passion for anything else. So I would show up to class, and people were excited to see me perform, and I was excited to perform. So I was like, I think this is it. For the first time in my life, I think I found something that I, I'm drawn to. And um, from there, I just started taking classes off campus. I did that for like two years, and then I left school, moved to Los Angeles, and just did the typical acting grind, doing student films, um, like C-level <laughs> asylum films, uh, like whatever I could, doing work for IMDB credit and, and food, a bag <laughs> lunch. I understood. Yeah, so um, I did that for a couple years, doing commercials and stuff, and I was like, this isn't working. I'm competing with hundreds of thousands of people, and people aren't even seeing me in these bootleg ass movies and stuff. And when I go to the barbershop, they're like, oh, a Cleveland family reunion. You had that ankle bracelet on. I was like, yeah. Um, so I was like, let me figure out, let me use, you know, whatever marketing I learned in school and figure out how I could fast track myself. And I was looking at people who was working. Um, and the thing that I saw in common for some people uh, was they had an audience. Um, in particular, Lil Romeo, Romeo Miller. I saw him on Instagram and he was always working on a project. I never seen him come out, but he was always on set. I was like, what is he doing <laughs> other than being Master P's son? And like, he had a, a show and all that, but, but I was like, he has a following. I gotta get a following somehow. And around that time, social media was popping up and I saw uh, Vine and I was like, uh, let me see. And the thing that attracted me to it was, it was an even playing field. Like you could only shoot from your phone. You couldn't shoot from a camera upload. You had to shoot things like straight through. There was no editing. So I was like, is it even playing field? The only thing that's separate me from anybody else is creativity. So it's just on me, you know what I mean? I don't have resources, but no one else can use resources. So I just kind of hit the ground running. I started storyboarding like 100 ideas. And I was like, the way I'm gonna post, I'm gonna just post a couple cool videos and then I'm gonna post the one that I think is the best on like the fifth one. So I got audience retention when they come to my page. And from there, I'm gonna strategically find people that have different audiences and we'll, we'll post in blocks and support each other. Like I just approach it from a business standpoint and it worked. And um, from there, I just use that as my groundlings to, to just build an audience and to, 
to hone in on my craft and learn improv and comedy. And after doing that for a couple of years in the national audience, you know, millions of people, I was like, okay, now it's time to transition back to the goal and kind of just completely isolated myself from social media and just focused directly on traditional acting. Okay, I'm going to hold you there That's for now. excellent. Yeah. That's, That's a great a, story. That's a great Thank hustle. You. Thank you. A little criminal, I guess. But, uh, and uh, Marilyn? DMV, stand up. <laughs> One person, you're not even proud you're of it. She's like, they have uh, job is like, no, DC, Maryland, Virginia. Please don't do that. Please stay sleep. Stay sleep. Stay sleep. Stay sleep. It's okay. I'm from Virginia and I ain't know what it meant till I went to college. So I'm with you. Right. Bro. I'm like, well, I you, got my you... driver's license. Okay. <laughs> so I was born in Nigeria. Um, all right. That's and right outside Virginia. Bro. That's right. It's like <laughs> right on the outskirts. Right <laughs> East. The, mm, just follow the, the Nile River. Thanks. Anyway, um, born Middle in Middle Passage. And then um, back when America liked immigrants, like they were giving away, um, you know, visas to come here and green cards. Was, yeah. And there was a nursing shortage. So my mom became a nurse at Howard University. Um, and then she was like, I got a family, so they brought us all over. So I grew up in Maryland, and I was going to be the doctor in my family because immigrants. Because you're Nigerian. Yes. And it, it went well for a little bit. Like, I went to GW. Um, and so did then, Kerry Washington. Is it my turn? I just, just <laughs> <laughs> Damn, you can't wow. even be a hype man wow. in 2023. Bust the rhymes, you are not. Damn, like. <laughs> my bad. Go ahead, dog. Do I you. Just hear you shining. Like, shining. What? You shining. What is happening? Let's all get along. Let's all love each other. Oh, How did We're that all friends. I got my, my Easter Sunday pink on. Let me have this. George Washington. Well so. <laughs> So anyway, so I went to GW, and the reason why I chose GW is because you could get into med school at the end of your sophomore year without having to take the MCAT. So I was like, oh, boom, sign me up. And then I didn't get in, and I was like, oh, snap, that's not going to happen now. And then I also failed organic chemistry because I don't like blood or science. <laughs> All the things you need that's a problem. To, that's a problem. to be a doctor. Uh, <laughs> and I really I thought it was going to be an OBGYN. I was like, yes, I think the concept, the idea of delivering babies. I was like, this is amazing. And then I saw blood. Like, even every month, I'm like, again? More blood? It's just... Uh. Anyway, so then I graduated, and um, I graduated, and then my parents were like, great, now are you going to med school? And I, 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 like, I didn't know how to lie to them, so I ended up getting my master's in public health because the one thing Nigerians love more than education is more education. So I got my master's. As I'm getting my master's, my brother has a friend who's doing, uh, it's called the Miss Nigerian America pageant. It's very self-explanatory. Um, you had to be a miss. You had to be Nigerian living in America on the nose. So I was like, okay, cool. I think I'm free on Saturday. And so I entered the pageant, and then two weeks before, they were like, what's your talent? And I was like, making straight A's. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, well, you can't do that on stage, so what's your talent? I was like, is this not the Miss Nigerian American pageant? Y'all know we are not allowed extracurricular activities, so <laughs> this is going to be a sham. But they were like, anybody who participates needs to have a talent. So at that point, like, I had, me and Jesus got tight, and so I was like, hey, fam, I need help. That's how I talk to God. And... <laughs> He was like, do comedy. I was like, nah, try again. And <laughs> he was like, well, what else do you have? Now, you got to understand, I was bullied. When I came from Nigeria to America, I was bullied by all the black kids. So, because I had an accent. So, y'all. Um, Old school black. Because I had an, I had an <laughs> accent. So, I was deathly afraid of rejection. And so, the one thing God is asking me to do, which is stand-up comedy, is the thing you get booed if you're not funny. And this is going to be in front of Africans, and they are the rudest people you will ever meet. It's not just like, you know, she's not funny. It's like, whose daughter is this? This is nonsense. Please, get her away. And I just did not want that in my life as an adult. But I, I leaned into it because God said, well, what else do you have? And I was like, nothing. And he was like, either you're going to learn to trust me or you're not. And I was like, I don't like this relationship we got going, but it's cool. Um, and so I did five minutes. Like, I did it like it was a, like a, a play. I memorized everything. I did, not, I did not know what pause for laughter was. And so I did it. And so I was like, why are they laughing? This is throwing me off. And I ended up doing really, really well, clearly. And then people at the end were like, do you do this often? And I said, I do. I do bar mitzvahs. I do. 
I'm out here. Like, I was, I was like, ooh. And I thought, I thought you made money, okay, as as a comic. So I actually, as a Nigerian, you you like do weddings and birthdays and said so like they pay you and then like I was a clean comic so I would do church events and I was like I'm getting money I'm never going to med school and then I moved to New York and I realized comics are poor and I said this is Very not poor. this is not what I signed up for um, and so soon left New York for LA, still poor, <laughs> still very poor, but made money hosting weddings, et cetera. And then uh, Issa Rae saw me hosting an African fashion show. <laughs> wow. I have and, footage of you hosting. Sir, it's, I, we can hear you. The mic is high. <laughs> we, we just don't know what you're saying. I'm bad. I didn't know it was on. I'm sorry. <laughs> what what in the on? cocaine bear? Okay. Um, Happy Sunday morning, y'all. So Issa, <laughs> Issa saw me host. Well, Issa and I, we like, I, I came to LA and I was like, like, Deb, like I was an unpaid internship. That's what they called it. It was yeah. an unpaid internship. And I was like, it still I'll exists, just, by the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was very unpaid. I was very struggling. And um, then I, I, I found out about Aqua Black Girl and I was like, oh, this is dope. So I hit Issa up on Twitter because I was like, that's what you do when you don't know somebody. Uh, turns out she had known me from my years of doing comedy. And so then she was like, we should get up. I was like, oh my God, Twitter is amazing. <laughs> she was like, and so anyway, uh, we were just running to each other and then I auditioned for Insecure and the rest is history. So we, now, we know what, you, what Yvonne's big break was. It was, it was Insecure and, and the relation with Issa, which launched her career. Um, I'm curious, what was the big break for the three of you? What was that project that like, you were like, okay, I'm, I'm in it now? Um, I was, look, I, I was at- Use your mic, use I your was, mic. I'm, it works. Hello? Yeah, now, now is the time for you to speak into your I mic. Am, yeah, am, this is the remember moment. Remember in the back, they mm. told us no rapper. This is the moment Thank right you. here. No rapper. Thank you. So, when I was at Juilliard, uh, my third year, uh, there was this guy named Michael Wynn, and uh, we all got together and wrote a play and we would go to class. I mean, we, it was, it's a conservatory. So we were in uh, class can I stop you 14. Real quick? Um, can you tell me the process of getting into Juilliard real quick? Oh, dude. Um, well. Yeah, he just kind of walked over there. I was like, that <laughs> so was a little black. I was like, I honestly didn't think you were right that smart. I got back That's from the moon. I'm not trying to brag, move. but I am. I was, like, was, was kind of studying engineering at this Dennis Space Station, mechanical engineering, thermodynamic fluid propulsion. Wow, you came a long way from <laughs> New Orleans. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you. Long way from the trumpet. Black. But I. <laughs> you were that tag, talented and gifted program. <laughs> oh, well, look at you. Okay, all right, finish oh, your story. Oh, I was. Thank you. Um, no, I. Um, the the audition process is you go up and you uh, do two contrasting monologues: contemporary, uh, classical, happy, sad. You sing a song, you do a dance move, and they decide if you get in. Like 3,500 people, they take 18 to 20 people. Second hardest school in America to get into. <laughs> so back. I went to GW. It was the most expensive school in the United <laughs> States. So I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you, you're in Juilliard, and now you're the big. We uh, we got together. We would get together every night because we were poor, and we would go to this place called Gray's Papaya. All the black, oh, the kids. great hot dogs. Yeah, you get two hot dogs and a papaya juice for two dollars. It was called the recession special. So every <laughs> night we would walk to Gray's Papaya and walk back. Also known as high cholesterol. <laughs> we, you know, and we wrote this play called Up Against the Wind about Tupac Shakur. And Tupac, you know, had just died, and it was such a huge moment in all of our lives. Like, I remember where I was when Tupac died. My first CD was strictly for my Tupac, right? And uh, we wrote this play, and uh, there was a guy named uh, Damien who was playing Tupac. And ironically enough, I was playing Biggie in the play, and I crushed it. I got great reviews, right? <laughs> and uh, it was a school production. And um, Damien graduated, and I was like, yo, give me a shot to play Tupac. And somebody from Showtime heard we were doing this play. And in the New York Times, you can look it up. They did a cover story about the black kids from Juilliard doing a play about Tupac. And one of my teachers said, usually the black kids just sit around and wait for us to do Shakespeare, wait for us to do Othello. And now they've created something for themselves. I think that's great. 
That's amazing. Yeah, fuck Othello. I ain't yeah. playing Othello ever in my Exactly right. So, <laughs> so we wrote this play. We created this play. I literally took my talents and built the set. Uh, Michael wrote it. Rosie directed it. We had this amazing production. And I got to play Tupac. And uh, uh, Jim Nicola from... Uh, uh, New York Theater Workshop, saw the play, took it to New York Theater Workshop. We did the play about Tupac off Broadway on the Lower East Side. This woman, God rest her soul, Molly Finn, saw the play and was like, I want you to meet Curtis Hansen. And I go in to meet Curtis Hansen and I audition for Mackay Pfeiffer's role. But Mackay Pfeiffer was famous and I was just me. So <laughs> they cast Mackay Pfeiffer and I got cast uh, for three days in four lines. And it was a Schedule F role. And I ended up being there for the entire four months. Oh, wow. And every day, Curtis was like, yo, I think we can expand this role. What you think? And I was like, well, OK. So he was like, can you rap? I was like, yo, if you give me two weeks, I can fly a helicopter. Just tell me what you want me to do. <laughs> so he just he turned my, my three-day role into a Schedule F role. And it was a run a picture role. And I made $66,000. A lot of money. So, dude, I called my dad. I was like, y'all, I got 60 racks, dog. <laughs> my dad said, boy, you rich. Yep. <laughs> I would have said so too. Me too. <laughs> listen, <Right>. listen. 60 G's. <laughs> and the rest was history. When was Molly it really history came, after? Like, you kept yeah. working from that day forward? Dude, literally from that day forth. Um, that was, I, I had been out of school for two months. And Hi, my name is Anthony Mackie, and out the gate, I was amazing. Look at me. My story is great. <laughs> it's really a great story. <laughs> Can't stand it. So, <laughs> you don't know struggle. I don't, I've never, I'm going to turn to my I turn my back off. I'm going to turn to my left. I, I came out swinging for the fences. So, Melvin Gregg. It was great. Had my Lord recession Hammer. hot dogs. I was so poor. <laughs> I was so poor. At Juilliard. Like, I just started eating good. <laughs> I was so poor. <laughs> two years ago. Gosh, I, I slept in my car for two months. I discovered kale in 2000. <laughs> <laughs> what is kale? <laughs> this is healthy shit. He probably didn't grow up in New Orleans either. He grew up in <laughs> the Wichita, Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> So Melvin, what was your, I mean, you, you, we, we know you, you started doing the videos and, and getting your audience, but what was your, your first quote unquote mainstream kind of break, like booking that you were like, oh shit, okay, I'm in it. Shit, I'm waiting for it. Um, <laughs> the black uh, thing coming out June 16th. Coming out June 16th. <laughs> yeah. Melvin Gregg and Yvonne Origin. Here you go. Take your friends. Birthday party. Tim story. Oh, happy um, birthday, Mike. Are we having a birthday party? Oh, happy birthday, party? birthday Mike. Birthday. We don't buy no drinks at the boat. I'll drink them. Um, I guess after social media, I was I was trying to tiptoe in and out because social media paid good money. Um, yeah, yeah, it paid good money, and uh, it was instant gratification, I, satisfaction. I have ideas, shoot it the next day, put it out. Ten million people see it by Friday, um, and film isn't that way. By the way, that's a process in itself to have ten million fucking people following you. That's not like something. That's like I got into Juilliard. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I shot. Yeah. Same thing. Same thing. Yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> Maybe sure. not. Uh, yeah. Higher education, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> Both here right now. Uh, um. Yeah. At one point, I was. I was. I was at a peak. I, I did a hundred million views on original content every week for two wow. months. Um, That's huge. Every week? Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Um, but I, I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy. That's, that's not why I moved out here. Mm, see, see? So, yeah, yeah. I, I left. And I had a production studio. It was like a 4,000 square foot spot where I built sets and offices what the and hell? all that type you had a studio. Did you eat all the fucking hot dogs so you could afford the studio? Like, nah. Oh, you're, nah. Making money, you're making money now on the social media. Social money. media. That's you're right. Making fun of me. Look who's not um, poor now. Like on a range. Like, what is the now. social media I had a money? Studio. I was like, building sets. <laughs> I'm Tyler. Perry. I'm trying to be Captain America. I'm, try, I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be <laughs> Anthony Mackie <laughs> over here, man. Let you me you my don't sex. know the struggle. <laughs> what are we talking about right now? Captain America. <laughs> we'll fight. Oh, my Conor mic's still on. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was just us. I thought it was just us. I'm sorry. Uh, Melvin, <laughs> I'm losing this fucking panel. <laughs> God Who invited this guy? It is my birthday, God damn it! Sit in my your bad. seat. No, they were making fun of me. My bad. My bad. Shh. Melvin, continue, please. Yeah, what was that? 
their studio. Oh, my studio. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. <laughs> Captain America over here is killing me. Uh, <laughs> you got an Avenger to shoot right now? <laughs> Ain't Jonathan Majors on y'all hip? Uh, <laughs> Good one, man. <laughs> um, oh, my fucking God. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, yeah. I quit. I quit. It was it was great, but I was like, this is not working, you know. Um, so I just stopped and it was like, I'm gonna just hyper focus on getting a traditional job. So my 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 team at CA, no more social media. Give me regular shit. Um, and the next month, I booked American Vandal, which was on Netflix. And what you whispering about over there? Move the mic to his mouth. No, I don't. I, I can't. He, I don't, he's trying to ask for my number, and I was like, I'm not gonna. Okay. <laughs> But I'm not going to engage. You over there no, sub-tweeting. Can I just say, because I, I think... Did you say I you're think, a team at CAA? I think, I think some people might have... Sir? <laughs> I think some people might have missed that. You were making enough money to have your own 4,000-square-foot studio. Get him. Get him, baby. You Get said, him, baby. Get him, baby. Nah, she going, she going in a different direction. Like, and, and, I don't know what's going on. Let her spit. spit. Let her spit. And then you took a step back. Yes. Do you understand what that is like when you have been broke... And you are actually making good money, and you're doing the thing. He wasn't that, poor, baby. And you're yeah. who kids your baby? Stop! All right, let, Wait, the, but, but, but let like, that pit bull loose. Go ahead, Anthony, girl. Right. I'm trying to actually okay. impart these young people who have come to hear something because there is that is a hard thing to do to say I'm not doing the thing that people know me for, yeah. and I'm, I'm making like, money from, and I'm art? making money from, and I'm going to take a risk and bet on myself to do this other thing that is actually going to bring me joy he like already that on that is that studio. is what stops people from leaving corporate jobs yeah. that's thank, what thank, stops thank people. you thank no. you stop it you know stop thank no thank no yeah 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 <laughs> but i was i was i was i was poor before mr juliard um, <laughs> And I knew I could get food stamps if I said I was homeless, and I'd be all right. So, uh, nah, nah, I, I, I took a step back. I was making, I was making great money, and I was like, nah, this isn't it. Money spends is gone. Um, I need some longevity. Um, I seen how people receive King Batch, who had hundreds of millions of followers, and I seen how people receive Michael B. Jordan, and it was different. It was like the popular kid from high school versus an uh, alien. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I stopped and um, just focused, and I booked a Netflix show and a Netflix film with Steven um, Soderbergh um, directing um, the next month. And from there, I just, you know, continue to focus Good on that. I love that. That's excellent. Yeah, but you still yeah, do yeah. some some of the social media stuff. Nah, nah, I don't. Um, I realized I built a monster over here, and in order for it to be seen as an act, I had to surpass that in a traditional space. And I couldn't surpass it if I continued to build on this one. So I just completely... I ain't make no money the next year, so, um, but yeah. I love that, I yeah. love that, and I think Yvonne's right. It's like, if you really have a focus on your passion and your dream, the distractions can come in the way, successful endeavors can come in the way, but if you stay focused and you persevere, the riches will follow. It's like good so is the enemy of great. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I mean, the betting on yourself. I mean, that's when people ask me, if, if for advice, I just say at the end of the day, you got to bet on yourself. Um, I, I got a couple of stories, but I guess. What was your first big, like Princess Diaries, or what was the? Yeah, one? Princess Diaries was my first big. Y'all don't know, by the way, first black woman to have a studio deal. Come on. This is Deborah Martin Chase. Put some respect on her name. Trailblazer, icon, fashion Thank diva. You. Um, yeah, it was Princess Diaries, and I guess just on the bet on yourself tip. Uh, I was partnered with Whitney Houston. We had a company at Disney for five years, and as we started shooting um, Princess Diaries, our company felt deal was not renewed. And so I made the movie, I finished it, I didn't have a job, the, there was a writer's strike looming yet again, and I went and I interviewed for a couple of, you know, big producers to like run their company. And I came out of an interview with a huge producer, white guy, and I was just like, I don't want to make his movies. Like, I'm at the point where I have a voice, I have something to say, I have, you know, experience, and I need, and I got in the business to break down stereotypes about us and to tell stories about women and people of color, and that's what I was passionate about. And to do anything, you got to, work like crazy and so you want to be passionate about it. So I just in my heart I said I think this movie 
has the potential to be special. I didn't know, you never know, it could screw up. You could make a great movie and they screw the marketing up, so you just never know. And the strike was looming and I was like going broke. And I remember I would sit out on my patio at night and I'm like, I just know the universe did not bring me this far to let me fail. So we did it, there was, a, in those days you did um, previews on Saturday night, put it in a newspaper and the preview went like gangbusters, packed, the audience loved the movie, A plus score, and I was like, oh, you know, we got a shot here. So my agent called the head of the studio, which was Nina Jacobson at the time, and said, you know, could you give Deborah a deal? And she was like, look, I, I can't. Politically, my hands are tied. We've got a lot of deals with, with big stars we got to get rid of. I can't bring somebody else on, but I'll give her a phone in an office. So the movie comes out, you know, in those days it was about $100 million. And it was like we did like $23 million the opening weekend. It's a big deal. Um, everybody's excited. My agent called back that Monday morning, said, what about a deal? She's like, I'm so sorry. I just can't do it. The second weekend, we do another 20. It's clear we're doing $100 million. And I get to my office on Monday, and Nina calls me. She says, I need you to come to my office. So I come there, and she's like, look, my kid was sick. I was on the floor with them Saturday night. And I started thinking about you. And I said, look, I had delivered for her and for the studio. And she was like, screw it. I'm going to take care of you. So I'm giving you a deal. I am putting the weight of the studio behind you. I'm going to do a big ass press announcement. You go out there and you do you. And so I'm crying, you know, my God. And the interesting thing is also in that moment, neither one of us realized that, we, that I was the first black person. It wasn't a person or woman? I think person. I mean, I don't know. I say woman, but uh, you know, very few, but certainly the first woman. And first black person producer to have a $100 million movie. Let's, let's um, so I, um, but it, so it just, and then, you know, it kind of went from there. So, but that was my big, like, I have my own company, my own deal, because I'd also run Denzel Washington's company before Whitney. Is he an actor? He has a little career. Heard him. Um, and took the journey with him, you know, from, he had an Oscar for Glory, but I took, Malcolm was in the can, when, so I took that whole journey with him, with Crimson Time, whatever. So anyhow, it was, um, that's how it happened. Amazing, amazing. <clears throat> We've heard uh, people reference their teams and their agents, and that's always been a fascinating process to me, like as you're ascending, and like you become like more of an incoming business, or at least someone that you can push out front. How do you guys go through the process of team building, and like what was the important things that you guys looked for in team? I'll start with you. I booked Insecure without an agent or a manager. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about that. <laughs> Nobody got 10%. Um, that really? Was, the yeah, whole run of the, like, that was all the first deal. Yeah. Seriously. Um, so what happened was... You have to pay commission. Baby. Yeah. <laughs> so I, it was really interesting how it happened. My, the, my former roommate, this is why it's so important to, to, to be good to the people who are coming up at the same level as you. Everyone is looking at like who's higher or even who's on this panel, but the girl that I lived with in New York, her name was Chi Chi, and we were all just, just trying to make it together. Chi Chi will started being a manager. She was uh, like, a, like a manager's assistant in a management company in New York. So she hits me and she's like, hey, this thing is, look at this Issa Rae show is like they're casting. And I'm like, oh, snap. And at that point, um, I was on, like, I had had my bout with depression. I was about to leave L.A. I was like, this God, you can have these dreams because they look like nightmares. And I ended up creating, like, a sizzle reel for my own show. It was called First Gen. And it was about this, um, like, Nigerian girl who decides to drop out of mezcal to do comedy. This is before Black Is. This is 2014. So this is before Black Is, before all the, like, run of shows that had actual black leads, before Bob Hart's I'd be show. I was like, I want to be the first to have, like, Nigerian characters on TV. So then um, it gets the attention of David Oyelowo and a one Oprah Winfrey. Um, this is all by the grace of Jesus, by the way. 
because no agent, no manager, no nothing. And we get Oprah like, yeah, I'll produce it. And I said, well, look at the father. <laughs> um, and so when Chi Chi tells me about Insecure, I hit up Issa like, girl, congratulations. And she was like, oh, well, I, you know, I, would you want to audition? I mean, I know your show is going. I said, nobody has bought my show. You know, I was like, Oprah is great. She is here. But nobody has bought the show. So I was like, so she was like, well, who submits you for auditions? I said, that's a... That's a good question, girl. Um, mm, stand by. Um, I knew somebody else in LA who worked for a management company. And so there's this thing called hip pocketing. So basically, she, I was like, can your manager submit me? And should I get it? I was like, I'll give him 10% for like the first season or whatever. There goes the 10%. And then. <laughs> It's a little I don't know what's going on with and, I, don't, I have no idea. Just say you like me, damn. Um, <laughs> this is so weird. <laughs> like, you're about to push me on the, on the jumping, jumble gym. <laughs> this is so awkward. I just met you. <laughs> Listening to your story. That's what I'm doing. So, so. So anyway, so I hip pocketed and then literally after the first season, so then of course, like, you know, agents came after after I booked it and I was just like, cool, but you all don't get no money because I, it's already been done. So after a year, he went off and I don't think anybody got any money from Insecure. Except, yeah, God is good. Um, yes. That's yeah, what, even yeah. when we renegotiated, because there was a UT, because then by that point I was at UTA, and so, so they yeah, packaged so, it. So God is good. So I'm insecure my UTA manager, lawyer, but insecure got you all that. What about you, Anthony? Did you get it right but, out of Julia? But, but, oh. but I will we're say not we're not done. Um, <laughs> but I will say once you have an established team, it's not for you to get comfortable in that no. because you really do have to. You have to keep them on their toes. You have you have to keep them honest, and you also have to look at you because like my right. thing is like. All right, well, what do I want to do? I don't want to play another lawyer. I've done that for, you know, five seasons. Like, what else? Like, you know, how do people see me? And then it is the thing of, like, you need people who can be honest with you. My manager is a black man from Baltimore. I was like, he's not afraid of me. D.C. Right. Wade. Yes, D.C. Right. Wade. Because of what happens, too, in the industry, sometimes people just don't want to tell you the truth. And I'm like, I'm a Nigerian woman. My mom calls me a goat every other day. <laughs> like, you can tell me the truth. And it's that thing of, like, being honest. Like, well, Yvonne, the industry doesn't really see you like this. So then it's like, okay, I'm not going to get mad. I'm just going to keep creating. I'm just going to keep doing X, Y, and Z so that they are forced to see me the way that I know that I can be seen because as creative as this industry is, it's actually really not that, that they, they don't have foresight. They're just like, what have you done lately? That is all you can do. And it's like, no, what the heck is not. And so when you talk about your teams and when you talk about uh, who you curate with you, it's like, all right, where do you want to go? You were the CEO. So even with fashion, I'm like, all right, well, I need new publicists that understand that I want to be seen in a different light. So then where do we go in terms of what am I wearing? Right. What am I? So it's, it's all curated, but you are the head and people are following you. Now, sometimes you're blessed enough to have people who see more for you than you see for yourself. And we, we thank God for those people. But for the most part, you are the one saying, hey, I'm not okay doing these things. What it the best calls I be having, I'm like, what is, not just Uzo Aduba saying no to, but what is um, Jennifer Lawrence saying no to? Right. Because see me differently. I'm not just black. I'm not just whatever. See me differently. I think that's great. That's a great segue to Anthony, actually. You know, no one saw a black man playing Captain America until a black man was Captain America and it was believable. Right. So that's... A Congratulations, black man. So how do you get that gig like I mean obviously have a great team around you as well but how does that happen I mean you're fucking Captain America dude like that's a big deal not yet I could get fired at any moment until that movie come out I'm sitting my black ass down <laughs> <laughs> don't be Terrence Howard <laughs> bruh <laughs> don't be Terrence Howard exactly that's you're... why I live in New Orleans can't get in trouble if nobody see you <laughs> but, but seriously like I'm not actually like saying trade secrets but like how does that like did, no, you, did I, it hand it to you? Do you uh, audition no, for not it? No, I had. A, I, I literally have a great team. I've had the same uh, team for 23 years now, and um, my it's agent, a lot about and loyalty. my manager. We the movie that I have here now. Like I went to them and I was like, "Yo, I want to do a love story," because I see all these dudes who have no resume, they have no training, they have no background, they have nothing dedicated to their craft. They do one movie, and all of a sudden. 
you know, they're on Instagram as the biggest star in Hollywood. Favor ain't fair, though. I don't know what happened, but go ahead. So, <laughs> Favor ain't fair. I mean, it's like, it's so, the playing the play oh, field yeah. is. Yeah. So I'm like. You can't knock that know either. That you, you can't. Because somebody can say the same thing about me. But they ain't saying that about me. Okay, Juilliard. Okay. Thank you. So, <laughs> she's so mad at me. It matters. So um, it was very important to me. Once I got my team, I was like, I, want, I don't want to be seen as that dude because I'm the only actor in the bunch that's been through three generations of actors. Mm -hmm. wow. Like I've seen three new crops come in and I've outlasted them. And that's because I've crafted my career in a way to where I've always focused on the type of movies I wanted to do, much like you, the way I wanted to be seen, much like you, and the way I wanted it perceived, like what you were saying. Yeah, so when Captain America came, you know, believe me, when I first met with Marvel, <clears throat> I wrote them letters because I wanted to be Black Panther. You know, a lot of people don't talk about it, but 12 years ago, I was avid before Black Lives Matter. I was avid in the press saying that we need a Wonder Woman movie. We need a Black Panther movie because little girls need somebody to look up to. Amen. And then I was told I couldn't say that because I'm a man. And I was like, that's crazy. So when I reached out to Marvel, I was like, yo, y'all need to do a Black Panther movie and I want to play Black Panther because black dudes need somebody to look up to. Mm -hmm. I won't go into the history of where I'm from and what I did and what I sold and what I was caught with, but I'm here now, so this is what we need to focus on. So, you know, creating that avenue, it just became a slow and steady burn and growth and uh, manipulated experience, you know, because, you know, I, I went to Julia. Well, listen. <laughs> but she you went to Harvard, like, by the way. She went to Harvard. I did go to Harvard. That ain't taking nothing away from I Harvard. Take, I mean, Harvard is a wonderful experience. <laughs> I mean, it's just Julia is harder to I get think, into. But one thing I all think, right, black bougie people, let's let's uh, calm the fuck down. I think listen. one thing we're all saying is it's that not me, Mike. It's not you me. get getting in is hard. Getting you know getting your leg in the door, but then you have to constantly reboot. You know. Re assess where you are, find it, you know, if you, you, cause you're gonna hit a wall, you gotta pivot, go around that wall. I mean, listen, we met, you know, you should tell, I mean, I, does this audience know your story? You cold called me, yeah. hit Hollywood. I'm the moderator, but um, <laughs> it's my birthday, so I'll talk about myself for a second. <laughs> um, no. <clears throat> Birthday. No, 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 no. no. Yeah. Um, Happy our, birthday. Our, <laughs> my name is Michael Jackson. I'll do all the singing. Thank you. Um, Deb is, as we know, incredible. Yeah, I was launching this company in 2010, 2011, and I was reading the PGA magazine, and I read about this incredible woman named Deborah Martin Chase. I was like, fuck it. I didn't use Twitter, but I still reached out. And um, I remember her off, so she's in New York, she's traveling, she'll get back to you. And I was like, whatever, she'll, I'll never hear from her. She called me that day, probably like two hours later, we had a great chat on the phone, we ended up meeting for lunch, and she's been in my life ever since. And um, I just think it's important to always, you won't always look forward, but it's okay to look back a little bit and pull someone aside. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to you to keep talking. Oh. We're not doing questions, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. He's the moderator, so he. So, but Melvin, American Vandal, he put still giving up streaming the all that the streaming content. Coming out of that, are you now being chased by reps? Like, what's your life look like as far as team building at that point? Um. So, prior to social media, I had like these little boutique agencies that couldn't get me real auditions. Um. But you, you own you the agency? Good? No. What? Oh, my bad. My bad. <laughs> What? <laughs> oh. <laughs> nah, I have boutique agencies. Um, but once I had a social media audience and they saw money coming in, um, UTA, I, I met with UTA and they were excited to sign me. But then I go to the office and I see like little Terry running around, like just a kid that's famous for being fat. And like, you know, just these social media circus acts. I'm like, bro, what, what, what is this? Like, um, and they ended up putting me on a shelf. Like I was just there and they were just trying to commission shit. Um, shout out, Terry Oden lost weight, for, like no shade to him, he grew up in, you know, he, he working on mental health, um, but he's an advocate, anyway, um, 
So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was on the shelf and I was like, man, this this ain't it, bro. Like, I go back to LA Casting, um, which is a website where you submit yourself if you don't have an agent. Um, but then I was doing a show, um, a Hulu show, and my representative didn't come to visit. They did no visit sets, and another agent came to see another one of my um, one of the other actors, and she was like, oh, I want to set a meeting with you. And I set a meeting with her. She's a black woman, um, which is like my. It's the, the demo I target, you know what I mean? If I got uh -huh. black women that hold me down, I, I'm good, I'm good, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I was like, cool, this is, this is perfect. And she was from CAA, and I signed with her, and from there, um, just been building with that team. But I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm still trying to understand the landscape. That's why I'm like, I'm really intently listening to y'all, because like, Yvonne was saying, you got to be the CEO of your, your business because I feel like a lot of times they're not working. I can't expect them to work as hard as me, but they're not working as hard as I would want them to work for me. Yeah. And I'm learning that I have to like kind of just give them tasks and, you know, like a boss, tell them, I need you to do this. I need you to do that. Because if I just sit back and wait for the phone to ring, like, you know what I mean? I'll be, right. I'll be on the shelf again. And the right. thing that is important, too, that I'm learning is to move with your gut because nobody else knows what's in your mind, the same way when you were doing those videos, you knew like, not like you can tell which one's gonna go viral, but you, you can tell when something's finished. You can tell when something yeah, yeah. is good. And I, I think so many times we wait for inciting incidents, like for something to be bad, and it's like, well, I have to leave them now because it's like, sometimes I'm just like, this isn't working. This isn't bringing me joy. I can't even put my finger on it, but before it gets bad, I think we should leave. You know, that's in every aspect of my life. Or, you know what? I want to do this. And it's like, well, you haven't done that. I'm like, I understand. But something is calling me to that. I just started directing. I have a short that I just directed last year. It's my first one right. with Paul Feig. Thank you. Um, thank you. It's called Jamal. It's a day in the life of a black man with no additional trauma. <laughs> and... Um, this you know, I like that. Thank you. And I remember... I had a break in my schedule, and I said, hey, I'm just going to go. I, I know Saladin Patterson, who's the showrunner for Wonder Years. And I said, hey, Sal, can I come on set and, I don't know, just watch another director? And I paid my way to Atlanta. I just was there on set. And then I was like, guys, I want to direct. I want to, like, like, try my hand at it. And sometimes, like, your agents are not going to be like, so do you want to direct now? It's like sometimes you have to be the one to be like, I want to do something, and yes, it may cost me, but I'm going back to go forward. They don't want you to. They don't want to give up that money. They don't want to give up the money that's already on the table. But it's like, if I do a great job, guess what? I could be the next Gina Prince Bothwood. Then yeah. we're all making money together. Like, don't look at the money. Look at look at the talent because you bet on me, baby. We always gonna make it. Hell, hello. If we, well, we, that's why I think it's also important to have a representative that gets you. Right, that's not just servicing you, but that understands you. And sometimes that, that it can mean going with someone who's not as prestigious, you know, but who's hungry. I mean, I, I, I eventually got to CAA, but at the right, at the time when I could really make full use of all the resources there, you know. And when I, when I decided to go into acting, DC, my manager, he knew the people over at Powder Keg, Paul Feig's company, who, who they whole, their whole mission is to help um, female directors, new female directors. And so it's like, there's a conversation. So he's like, yo, you said you wanted to do this, right? Okay, apply for this program. But it's like, I showed the interest first. And so like, to your point, when you have people who know how to champion you and also you champion yourself, first Absolutely. and foremost, then you give them the blueprint on how to love you, on how to support you, on how to, you know, work How to help you. you. Yes. Where, you know, how to take you, how to help you reach your goal. Mm -hmm. Awesome. We're about to wind it down. I have one more question for you guys, which is basically like, and it, it kind of perfect segue from trusting your gut, following your instinct. What would you tell your 20-year-old self that's like young and embarking on this journey, like words of advice? Anthony, I'm, a ner I'm nervous, but Anthony. <laughs> Captain America, Juilliard, speak. Welcome to Juilliard. Um, <clears throat> um, one thing that I learned early in my career, because I 100% did it the way I wanted to do it. Um, you know, I was a, am, am a theater kid. So I started in the theater, I was raised in the theater. You know, one of my first jobs was understudying Don Cheadle off Broadway. Wow. You know, so I, I never got into it to be famous. I got into it because at seven years old, I said I wanted to be an actor. 
So people always come to me and they're like, do you have any advice? And I'm like, well, you're not going to like what I have to say because my answer is always training. Mm -hmm. Like not too many people can do Shakespeare as well as play Tupac, as well as, you know, play a gangster, as well as I've never been pigeonholed in a place to where somebody was like, you can only do this because I you know, did the work. I did the work. I think that's and I got the background, you know, I got 80 something credits to my name. So you can't, there's so many actors out here. You know here. how hard it is to get 80 credits in this business? No, but there's- That's incredible. There, thank you. There's so many actors out here and I talk about this all the time. I'm like, yo, dog, y'all don't work. Like I'm in my twenties, I was busing four or five movies a year while doing six months on Broadway because I was working. You know, and I'll never forget, I'll say this, and this is what was most important to me, the biggest lesson I learned. 2006, I met with Catherine Bigelow to do a movie called The Hurt Locker. Awful title. Uh, we were at the Four Seasons in LA. I was in LA work and I met with Catherine Bigelow, Mark Bowl, and uh, my dude Greg Shapiro, great producer. And Catherine wanted me to play a, a smaller, the third lead. The conversation I had with her was, why can't I be the lead? I said, uh, the military and, 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 and killing and, and fighting for rights is not about race. Agreed. Different people of different colors and different sexes die every day for this country. So why do you want me to play this role? So I pitched her why I should play that role. She gave me the role. <clears throat> I was doing this movie. That never came out. Awful director, awful movie. He's awful. It was called Bolden. The director is awful. <laughs> so, you, so tell us how you really feel. It. He's awful. Everybody it was awful. And um, <laughs> I was doing Bolden. It was supposed to be a three-month shoot. It went over to six months. Wow. Six months. And so we contacted Catherine, and we were like, yo, I'm going to have to back out of the Hurt Locker because... I'm stuck on this movie. I'm dedicated to this movie. We're shooting this movie. And she goes, understandable. Greg goes, understandable. Mark goes, understandable. So I backed out of the Hurt Locker. They offered it to another actor. And he said, no, because it wasn't enough money. Mm. OK? They called back, and they're like, yo, if, if we push till the day that you rap, will you come to the Middle East and do the Hurt Locker? I said, hell yeah. The day after I rapped Bolden, I got on a plane. I flew to Amman, Jordan, shot the Hurt Locker, which nobody thought was going to be. I mean, literally, I got in a fist fight with a writer on set. Nobody thought it was going to be a good movie, right? Catherine had a vision. Catherine had a dream. Catherine put that movie together. Two years later, we won Best Picture. Yeah. And the funny thing is, this dude said no to the movie because it wasn't enough money. I made the same amount of money I made on 8 Mile on her like crushed it. Bought a new car. <laughs> it was a Ford. It was quite nice. Um, it was fully loaded. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was a Pacific. Was cool. We have one minute so, left. Okay, okay. So, but the crazy part about this story <laughs> is someone said no to this job because it wasn't enough money. I was able to push, do that job, go to Jordan. We win Best Picture, and that's what got me Falcon. Right. Right. Ten years later. So the takeaway is training and preparation. And everything, what I can loosely gather from that story is that everything me matters. Everything. There's nothing. Don't be quantifying my story. I didn't even say Everything anything. you do is a building block. What advice would you give, young lady? You never got to your 20-year-old self, but that's cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's like, what I would tell you. Can you talk to your 20-year-old self for me, Yvonne, please? My 20-year-old self... Um, this was like five years ago, by the way. Bless you, baby. Um, my 20-year-old self, I would tell her... Keep smiling. There, there is no clock. Keep shining. That's so there important. There is no clock. Because I think, I didn't pop till I was 31, but I had been doing the work since I left gr grad school. How old are you in? Yeah. That's you know what I mean? Important. So it's like, and I think sometimes when we start, 
people are like, I got to make it by tomorrow. It's like you just got here. And maybe you have the story you get, you know, right out of Juilliard. That's God bless it. That's a great story. It's not everybody's testimony. And so sometimes it is you're 31. It is you were 35. And I think when I took the fear of my timing out of the equation, I could actually sit into my purpose. So and, important. And, so yeah. important. So much pressure around the clock. And it's like, do yourself live your best life, Deb. The title of this session is Why Not Me? So when I was sitting practicing law, miserable, uh, in, not in Houston, Texas, uh, and I would just say to myself, other people are making movies, why not me? Now, and that was, and that was what led me to, I spent a year uh, working as a lawyer, but reading everything, I preparing myself, training, reading everything available about what a producer, because I didn't even know what a producer did, right? But I knew I wanted to be the person who came up with ideas and for movies and really guided them along. And went to seminars, talked to anybody who would talk to me. And then when I got to Hollywood with the why not me, I realized, oh, nobody who looked like me has ever done what I wanted to do. So that it was that much harder, but it was still, if somebody else can do it, I can do it. Amen. Any, any parting words of advice for your 20 year old self? Buy Bitcoin and sell in 2021. <laughs> Um, <laughs> nah, nah, but I feel like everything that happened along my uh, process, you know, it all played into my nail, which I'm happy where I'm at. Um, of course, I want to go further, but this is a point in my, my, my um, journey. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't tell myself anything. Even things that I thought were mistakes, you know, something came from me that led me here. So I guess I would tell anybody else um, or tell myself to just trust the process. And, um, yeah, like, like you said, you know, why not me? And just keep that in mind whenever you get discouraged or feel like, you know, it can't be you. Just know it can be and just continue to move forward in your path and trust the process and do the right thing for the right reasons. I think to sum up what I was going to say, it was do it your way. If someone else's journey is not yours. Thank you guys so much for point. coming I out. <laughs> I was going to say thank y'all. Thank you guys for giving me the craziest birthday of my fucking life. I appreciate y'all. <laughs> Do it your Bye. way. Bye.